Thank you, Jason, and thank, thanks for inviting me to talk. I feel a little bit like the, um, the cheap luncheon meat in a sandwich of a very expensive artisanal baguette uh, <laughs> uh, surrounded by such an illustrious faculty, but never mind. Um, I'll do my best. Now, I'll be given this very difficult topic to, to cover in 20 minutes. Um, and I know there'll be probably different levels of comfort with these omic uh, subjects, but I'll try and do it some justice as best I can. So probably worth starting right at the basics, which I'm sure you all know, but this is, I guess, relevant to what we want to talk about. And that's always good to think about the, the central dogma of biology, which is essentially that uh, uh, life um, is coded in DNA and all, all, all the um, structure and function of our, of our cells, and DNA replicates itself. And obviously within the DNA is a genetic code, and the study of that entirety of, of that genetic code is genomics. And that's transcribed into RNA, a process of transcription. You can study that with transcriptomics, which I won't talk about today, which is also an interesting thing to consider. And then ultimately <laughs> these produce proteins in the process of translation, and the study of your entirety of your sort of uh, protein, um, uh, proteins that you produce is proteomics. So I'm going to be talking about the genomic component and the proteomic component. Um, I could summarise the talk from the microbiology um, perspective probably in one slide, just to keep it very simple. So when we talk about proteomics, we're really talking about Moldytoff. And Moldytoff has been, as anyone who works in lab will know, has revolutionised what we do in microbiology. So this is something when I started training I'd never even heard of, and now it's absolutely central to everything we do. And it's really changed the speed and accuracy and simplicity of a lot of, in fact we're sort of beginning to forget all our biochemistry and bench tests that we used to all love and know. And this is very much now mainstream in the lab, and I'll talk a little bit about how that, how that works and how we can use it in terms of AMS. But the next thing on the horizon is going to be whole genome sequencing, and obviously there's a lot of interest in this, a lot of excitement, but we still don't really know how we're going to handle this in a clinical laboratory and where it really fits in terms of clinical outcomes. So it's not so much, but it's coming. So there you go, I can all go home at that point. Um, I'm really going to focus probably on bloodstream infections because I think on a, for an, an AMS point of view, that's probably where the biggest bang for your buck is going to be. And in terms of the lab, that's probably our core business, sort of identifying patients with most severe infections. And they're obviously common. They're associated with high mortality. Um, uh, and as you can see, there's some stats there in terms of the healthcare costs and the burden on the, on, on the uh, healthcare system as a whole. And we know that patients with sepsis if they're identified early and given appropriate therapy, this is associated with improvements in mortality and other clinical outcome measures. But we know that our empirical therapy is often pretty poor, and depending on where and when you look, around a third of the time we get it wrong, or we give far too much treatment, or patients end up in this kind of empirical nightmare of having 20 different treatments before we work out what's actually going on. And we're also not very good at de-escalating. So once we start empirical therapy, we're quite bad at stopping. Once we've sort of convinced ourselves that there may not be an infection or could not be or no evidence of infection, we sort of keep going just in case. And I think the laboratory and sort of improving our rapid diagnostics and using some of these technologies is where I guess we can have a real sort of impact in this, in this area. So this is sort of what we do normally, and you'll all sort of be familiar with this, and certainly anyone who's worked in a lab will understand that, you know, traditional microbiology has done the same thing for about 100 years, and it's a bit like gardening. We have to sort of wait for things to grow, and we talk to them nicely and give them carbon dioxide and so on. But it's a pretty slow process. So each of these steps, you know, we're often taking half a day or a day or longer to wait for these things to sort of go through the system. And it's quite sort of systematized. We do something in the morning, and then we don't do it again till the next day, uh, and so on. So it's fairly leisurely. It's a nice uh, occupation. <laughs> but probably things will be changing <laughs> as time goes on. Um, but there's certain things we can do to kind of speed up this process. We have a few phenotypic tests like coagulase for Staph aureus. We can do lots of sort of simple bench tests which give us clues like is this a Pseudomonas or an E. coli. Um, and we often can do these sort of direct susceptibility tests from blood culture which gives us an early warning about could this be a very resistant strain. But it's probably about as much as we can do in terms of pushing the envelope uh, in terms of getting as close as we can to this, this point which is when the patient comes in and is sick. And the problem is this leaves this patient in this sort of what I sometimes think of as like an empirical vortex where no one quite knows what's going on. We know they're sick. We know they probably have an infection. And we get sort of incremental little bits of information as time goes on. Sometimes that causes more confusion uh, than is necessary. And patients often end up having about 20 different treatments in the meantime and lots of confusion reigns. 
And then often when we want to do sort of more sophisticated things like typing or PCR specific genes or look at you know, um, proper MICs, these can really be many days or even weeks later or probably never at all most of the time. So what about MOLDITOF? So I said that's really probably very much mainstream now. There's the acronym there for those of you who like to learn these things. But to put it very, very simply, it's a fantastic piece of technology that's really come from sort of chemistry and sort of left field outside of microbiology. And the basic idea is you get your bacteria, you put it in a matrix on a metal plate, you zap it with a laser, this ionizes those molecules, and then they're sort of accelerated through a tube towards a detector, and the speed that they travel down that tube is dependent on their mass and their charge. So the mass to charge ratio is picked up by that detector, and it generates a spectrum. And this is essentially like a, a signature that is unique to a particular organism. And we now know, now that we have really good databases, we have millions and millions of these organisms that have been generated, and these commercial, uh, these commercial systems now are very, very accurate, very, very quick. And the amazing thing is, although the instruments are expensive, it can be get a result in a few minutes, and it costs like 50 cents. And it really has changed what we do. There we go. So in terms of where that sort of helps us in the timeline, and we find in our laboratory here and many other laboratories across the place, the way we've sort of worked out that this works best is using a sort of early growth moldy. So we get from the gram stain, we put it on to say a chocolate agar, we might give it a few hours in the incubator just to get enough growth, and we can moldy from that. And if you get a good ID from that, that's highly predictive. So that's good enough to phone a clinician and say, I think you've got a Staph aureus or a Pseudomonas or whatever. And in our hands, we found that's really very much now our laboratory standard. So that's really sped up the kind of identification component of this process. But it doesn't tell you anything about susceptibilities or, or more sophisticated information. But that's really made a big difference. There are kits available for sort of moldy direct from blood culture. They can be a little bit labor intensive. And I guess we found that it probably isn't necessarily worth the extra effort when you can do this slightly simpler process. And people are obviously interested in things like direct detection and resistance mechanisms by moldy, which I haven't really got time to talk about here, or even moldy-based typing. So there's lots of possibility for sort of using an existing technology and trying to expand it into sort of further areas. But I guess one big thing about this is, well, what's the clinical impact of this? What does this really do for a patient? Um, how can we assess the, the clinical utility of introducing these new technologies? And there are lots of kind of studies like this, and this is just an example, which have certain problems, but which we'll sort of talk about. So this is a way things are often done. You do a sort of before and after an intervention study. So this is one of these bundles, as they like to say in, in the US, where they've introduced a stewardship program with MOLDITOF, and then they've subsequently used this sort of multiplex PCR system called BioFire, which is a sort of a, a, a multiplex, multi um, sort of organism detection resistance um, uh, gene mechanism. Uh, and they've sort of split that into two phases and they've looked at sort of before and after. And this is a fairly typical thing as you can show that, you know, up, uh, on top of standard care, once you introduce MOLDITOF, uh, you can sort of improve your time to appropriate antibiotics or to de-escalation and sort of, you know, until you get some rationalization to your treatment. And there seems to be a little bit of additional benefit from adding in the film array as well. But the difficulty is you're sort of adding in multiple interventions at the same time. So it's hard to know, is this from the technology or is this from the stewardship? Uh, obviously, it's an observational study, a sort of before and after thing, lots of other variables that could be affecting these outcomes. And they often don't really measure patient-centered outcomes. You're really just looking at an extra day of less antibiotics. So the real clinical impact is a little harder to know. But the good thing is some people have tried to do like randomized trials of diagnostic tests, which I think is a, a thing we should consider more and more. So this is, from, again, from a single center in the US where they randomize about 750 patients to essentially sort of normal care, uh, a multiplex PCR rapid test, all that combined with stewardship. And what's interesting is that although when you introduce a multiplex PCR on its own, it actually doesn't do very much in terms of rates of de-escalation and time to appropriate antibiotics. The only thing that really makes a big difference is when you add in an active stewardship program. So this is where you can all feel very comfortable with yourselves. Um, but I guess it makes the point that just having a technology on its own is not the answer. You have to have it integrated in a system where that's fed back to clinicians and affects some sort of action at the end of the day. The other problem is when you look at clinical outcomes, often it's quite disappointing. And in fact, they couldn't really demonstrate any 
uh, impact on mortality, length of stay, toxicity, and all those other things we'd really like to be getting a handle on. Now, obviously, it may not be powered for that. It's a sort of relatively small study. The only thing that was significant was obviously increased cost. <laughs> so, uh, so these things are tricky. So it's very easy, to, I think, to show that you can get, you know, improved sort of interim measures like, you know, improved time to antibiotics and de-escalation, but proving clinical outcomes that, are, that are, I guess what we ultimately want to be is much harder and proving which components of those interventions are having the effect is also quite tricky. So that's a little bit about proteomics in 10 minutes. Uh, I'm not sure if I've done it justice, but that's a little summary. Uh, but moving on to genomics, the great promise of genomics obviously is that you know, all of life is encoded in DNA. And if we can have a single technology that can uh, decode that DNA blueprint, essentially you could decode any organism you might want to think of. So it's like a, a universal uh, analytical process that you could use to understand uh, pathogens. And whole genome sequencing has really now come of age for several different reasons, but mainly driven by technology. So we now have platforms that can uh, produce exponentially greater amounts of data in a shorter period of time and for much, much reduced cost. And it's probably the cost that is the, the, the real driver of this. So when they, the first human genomes were being produced, they obviously cost billions and billions of dollars. You can now do a bacterial genome for about 100 bucks. It'll probably soon be much less than that. And that's very much becoming within the realms of a, a clinical diagnostic lab. Um, and as I said, the real potential of this is that you can capture a whole load of clinically relevant information in a single analytical process. So not only can you have your species, you can have all your resistance genes, your strain typing, your virulence factors, pretty much anything you might want to find within that genome could potentially be available to you to influence your treatment. The real sort of leader in this field is Illumina, which is a, a, a very sort of stable and well-established platform, but we'll talk a little bit about some of the limitations in the sort of microbiology field. I won't go into all the details, but it's essentially very clever. You smash the DNA up into multiple, multiple millions of tiny little fragments. You attach these adapters. You sort of amplify the amount of DNA on this thing called a flow cell. And then you reconstruct the sequence in each of those fragments using these fluorescent um, uh, uh, nucleotides. And you have the sophisticated cameras that can actually register the color change on each base and reconstruct. Um, uh, reconstruct your genome computationally by sort of stitching together all these tiny little reads. And this is the way I guess I've, I think about it because I'm a simple man. So if you imagine this is a very small genome, so this is Shakespeareomics for you. Uh, if you chopped out that genome as, as would be done with Illumina into tiny little fragments, each of those fragments doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. But what you can do by using sophisticated algorithms, you can sort of piece those together, align them, and then make a longer contiguous uh, consensus sequence that makes sense. And that's how you basically reconstruct your genome. So that's how short read sequencing works. And as I said, that's at the moment the sort of market leader in terms of uh, genomics. It's very much was used in human uh, genomics, and we're using it more and more for bacterial genomics. But you want to know, I guess, can we put this in a clinical lab? Can we start doing sequencing, you know, on the, at the bedside or straight from a gram stain? It would be lovely if we could, but there are still lots of barriers to this. One, one thing is that even when you really push the envelope, you still have to remember that you have to DNA extract, so you have to get a decent amount of DNA. Then you've got to work out if you've got enough DNA or the best quality DNA. You've got to make your DNA libraries, which again takes four to six hours, even with the sort of best kits in the world. The sequencing itself on Illumina takes at least 24 hours, usually a bit longer. There are some accelerated protocols you can use, but the data you get is not necessarily enough. And then you've got to think about the bioinformatics, and then you need some clever person with high-end high computing skills to sort of really make sense of this. Now, I think there are ways that we will be able to shorten this process, but using Illumina is still a bit of a challenge if you want to compare it to what we do at the moment using Moldy and, and rapid uh, you know, bench tests and that sort of thing. So it, it's coming, but there's a lot of technical challenges. But I guess the real new kid on the block that is creating a lot of excitement, you may have heard of it, is a thing called Nanopore. This is a really extraordinary technology. This is actually a sequencer. It's about the size of a big USB stick. You can actually sequence a whole bacterial genome in there. You can stick this in your pocket. It plugs into your laptop. Um, and it essentially takes these very long strands of DNA and runs them through a biological pore. And the 
change in uh, charge across that pore as with each base as it goes through is registered and recorded and you basically reconstruct your, your genome sequence. And this happens in real time. So you can actually see the data coming off the machine you know, as soon as you start plugging it in. Now there are problems with high error rates. It's not as accurate as Illumina, but as I said, it's real time and it's rapid. And I guess the real promise is, can we bring whole genome sequencing back to this point, you know, at the point where the patient presents with sepsis? The biggest problem is going to be the amount of DNA load. Um, even in somebody with frank bacteremia, the amount of bacterial DNA in their blood compared to human DNA is going to be very small. There's lots of interest in concentrating that DNA and trying to sort of pull that apart from all the human DNA. But I think in reality, we're probably going to be a little bit stuck probably more towards this point, this still needing a culture step to amplify that bacterial DNA. But from there, you can get all the information you might want. And that's, I guess, really the promise of where this, we hope this could be. The real thing is how quickly can you do this and will it replace some of this slower technology? So this is actually our esteemed head of department, uh, Crispin Heikowitz. Uh, and this is, we had a, a workshop here a few months ago where we actually put a Klebsiella, uh, some Klebsiella DNA in there within literally a matter of minutes. We put it through the minion here, this tiny thing, and within minutes we were able to see that it was a Klebsiella. Soon after we were able to show what resistance genes it had, sequence types, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, when you see it in action, it's really quite amazing. Uh, and I think this is going to come. It's just not quite there in terms of uh, where we can use it in real life, and it's still quite expensive. The other thing is I think people are really trying to streamline the downstream automation process. So, for instance, this is a thing called micro-predict. This looks at Staph aureus genomes, and you basically dump your genome straight off the machine into here, and within minutes you get resistance genes. Uh, you can, uh, and again, it's very, uh, very quick, and studies have shown that it's actually pretty accurate. You get very few major errors uh, in terms of predicting resistance. And that's for Staph aureus. It's much more complex for gram negatives, um, and I won't go into that too much. Uh, but again, this is a huge area of research, is how can we predict the uh, phenotype from the genotype with enough accuracy to base patient treatment on that. And for some organisms like that Staph aureus, it's fairly easy. Something like Pseudomonas, it's much more of a challenge. But as I said, the great thing is you can then start getting all kinds of other things uh, that will help uh, not only inform your treatment, but look at infection control, public health information. Uh, you can look at resistance genes. You can combine it with clinical metadata and start understanding how these things are transmitted throughout the hospital, how strains relate to each other. You can start building phylogenetic trees. You can look at mobile genetic elements and other things that will influence gene expression. But um, I'll leave you just with this one thought. All this stuff is super cool, but I guess we have to come down to the fact as well, just because we can do it, doesn't mean we should necessarily always do it. And I think we have to very carefully think about how we're going to integrate this into the clinical lab and what the, the sort of clinical utility and patient benefit is going to be at the end of the day. Otherwise, we might just drown ourselves in data and complexity and cost and, and, and get nowhere. So I'll stop there and just say thanks to all the various other people in Queensland we work with, and I'll stop there. <laughs>